So one of the big mysteries of how to make your car handle right is how to adjust your shocks. Now I'm kind of known in the industry as a suspension expert and I get hired to sort out the handling troubles of a lot of different cars, uh, a lot of different race cars, uh, special projects for OEMs that I can't really talk about, but basically I do this a lot. And one of the biggest things I found when working with other race teams, helping my friends, and even the OEMs is whenever there's a handling problem, the shocks aren't adjusted right. And uh, it's actually pretty simple. And I'm going to be starting a series about how to adjust your shocks. It's probably going to be a few different parts because um, it's kind of hard to cover the subject in one video. But uh, I'm going to break it down, make it simple, and make it impossible for you to really dick your shocks up. So we're going to start really simply. So in this installment, I'm going to teach you how to adjust the most basic shock, uh, the single-way adjustable coilover. Before we get started, I'd like to thank KW Suspension and Suspension Techniques for letting me raid their SEMA show booth and taking their demo shocks. Uh, actually having the shocks here to show you visually is a big help, so thank you very much. I would say the number one mistake that people make when setting up a car with coilovers is they make the car too low. Um, it's a big temptation. You're trying to make your car look cool for the grams. Um, you want the wheels to be filling up your wheel wells. And yeah, we got, got to admit, it all looks sweet. But being too low has several problems. Um, as far as your shocks are concerned, uh, the biggest thing is uh, when you make your car low, you don't have much wheel travel. Now, almost all co coilovers are designed to be lower. So... They're shorter, um, the bodies are shorter, they're designed to be uh, low, but people always got to go that extra bit and they end up messing things up. So what happens is you run out of travel and you're running very close to the bump stop. Um, one, this doesn't ride very well. Um, the car doesn't handle bumps, like maybe little bumps is, are okay, but not you know, like your bigger bumps that you experience on the street a lot. Um, the other thing is, is that under the loads of cornering, uh, when the car rolls over, squats, or nosedives under braking, um, the, the bump stop touches down and the shock's bottomed out. Now when this happens, your effective spring rate, or the rate that your tires sees, goes from like whatever the spring rate is in the coilover to like infinite almost. So what happens is that tire at that end that bottoms out starts running at a big slip angle, and what it equates to you as the driver is, that end of the car will suddenly start to slide. So if it's in the front, you start to understeer all of a sudden. If it's in the rear, you start to over, oversteer, which can lead to spins and a lot of drama, and at least very difficult to control handling. So obviously, you don't want the car to touch down in steady state cornering. Um, so how do you avoid this? Well, one, maybe you can run the default height that your coilover manufacturer recommends. Um, a lot of coil manufacturers don't recommend one, but uh, a company like KW or Suspension Techniques does in their little instruction book. Um, lacking that, uh, what you want to do is set your car up so you have at least maybe a couple of inches of travel in the uh, coilover itself before it, it hits the bump stop and you can kind of see that. If it's an A-arm car, you want to maybe have at least an inch. Um, the other thing too is when you actually drive the car, uh, what you could do is see how much travel you're actually using. Now in race cars, we have all kinds of position sensors and uh, data logging and cool stuff, but you know, you're not gonna have that in your street car. So my favorite trick is to um, use a zip tie. It's very simple, you put a zip tie on the shock shaft. Uh, if you can see this shock here, uh, we have a uh, zip tie. And uh, you just kinda wanna put it, you know, like maybe push it all the way down so it's at the bottom. Then you wanna drive around. Um, you wanna do some car hard cornering braking and acceleration uh, while not hitting big bumps. 
after you do all this, you want to see where your zip tie ends up. So if your zip tie is uh, to where maybe you're just off the bump stop, maybe that's a good place for you to be. If the zip tie is jammed all the way up inside the bump stop, then you know under normal, normal hard driving loads, you're actually uh, bottoming out the shock, which could lead to um, some bad handling things. So what you want to do is increase your ride height to where um, that doesn't happen. Uh, the other thing you can do is uh, maybe increase your spring rate or maybe do a combination of both. But that's how you kind of decide your maximum uh, practical lowness that you can run and still have good handling. Um, the other last thing about making your car too low, and this especially applies to uh, coilovers that you can independently adjust the spring preload and the uh, perch height. Um, these kind of coilovers allow you to get really low. And what happens with these kind of coilovers is you can adjust them so you go beyond the ability of your suspension joints, like your ball joints and uh, your sway bar end links. Um, you go beyond their ability to articulate. So the, your, your ball joint will bottom out of the socket. And uh, you know when this happens, you can bend your control arm, you can break the ball joint, you can break the ball joint stud. And this is a major structural failure and you're probably gonna crash. Um, not joking either. It also gets to the point where your sway bar end links can't articulate anymore. So you get binding with your sway bar, which can cause a spike in wheel rate and cause sudden over or understeer. Uh, you can bend your sway bar, uh, you can bend your end links, and um, at the very least, your uh, end link angularity will be weird, so then your sway bars won't be very effective. Sway bars work the best when the end links are at 90 degrees to the end of the sway bar. And if the link is all like at a 45 degree angle, um, your sway bar is not very effective at that point. Besides running out of wheel travel and the problems that that can cause, making your car too low can also mess with your suspension geometry. Uh, when your car is really low, the angularity of your links are all way out of their design position and it causes problems like too fast of a camber curve. Uh, this can cause a lot of loss of grip because you tip the tire up on the inside too quickly. And it can also cause some instability. Um, you can also get bump steer. Bump steer is an issue. This is when your toe links or your tie rod ends are traveling in a different arc than your control arms. Uh, and it'll make the car toe in and toe out as the suspension moves. Normally, uh, bump steer is okay around the stock ride height, but when you're running at the extremes of the travel, um, the bump steer or toe steer can get really bad, and this can cause a lot of instability. Another thing that can happen with being too low is that your roll center locations can get off. Um, when your roll centers are too low, um, what happens is your roll moment, which is the distance between your roll center and the center of gravity, gets really big. It actually creates a long lever arm to make your car roll even more, even though um, your CG is getting low. Uh, that's one problem. Sometimes, depending on the link geometry, your roll centers can get too high and the lateral instant center can move inboard. When this happens, the car wants to jack under cornering load. So uh, it kind of wants to pole vault over itself on the suspension links. Um, a good example is Corvairs or old VWs do this really badly to where they can even roll over. But um, jacking can be a lot more subtle, like R32 GTRs do this in the front. Uh, if you ever notice that a poorly modified R32 GTR, instead of rolling over in the corner, the front kind of goes up under hard cornering load. Uh, this is an example of jacking, uh, and jacking can cause instability in the loss of traction. Another thing that could happen with the geometry is your anti-squat and anti-dive can get all messed up. Um, generally, uh, when everything gets all off like this, the anti-squat goes uh, extremely high. Uh, this can cause uh, a wheel hop in the back and a loss, loss of traction. Um, if this happens in the front of the car, you can also have skipping and uh, 
another loss of traction. So these are all reasons why you don't want your geometry to get extremely off. Now, uh, if you're a race car builder, you can do a lot of things to mitigate this and still run a low ride height, but this is all advanced stuff and uh, usually involves a lot of fabrication and things. So we won't be getting into this, but as a guideline, don't make it too low. The second thing that you need to be aware of when uh, installing coilovers on your car is that a lot of coilovers come with an adjustable camber plate like this, which means uh, whenever you install them, you should align your car. Now, a lot of people overlook this, then they just put in their coilovers and go. But, you know, like you totally need to align it, your alignment will be off. Even coilovers that are like really street oriented, like uh, this uh, suspension techniques and this uh, KW V2, uh, they use the OEM top hats so you get better um, noise, better vibration, better ride comfort. Uh, you don't have that sp spherical bearing to make noise. Or you look at this uh, KW, it actually has a camera plate. Even if you don't have a camera plate, you're still changing your ride height and you need to realign your car afterwards, so don't forget. Uh, the other thing about coilovers is they all have adjustable spring purchase. So you have to worry about corner weights. Now, on the street car, uh, in my personal opinion, getting an exact corner weight isn't that critical because in a street car, you have different weight distributions, you know, you have passengers sometimes, sometimes you don't, sometimes you're carrying luggage, etc. So you can't expect to have perfect corner weight. But what I found is if you measure your uh, perch height and uh, make it so it's equal from side to side on the car, your corner weights end up being pretty close, you know, close enough for a street car. Now this is all different for a race car. If you have a race car, you just about must corner weight it. So what you want to do is put the car on your scales. Um, you know, corner weighting is the whole subject of probably another video, but in short, what you want to do is move weight around in the car by maybe playing with your perch height a little bit and maybe actually moving parts on the car. So you have as equal as possible weight from front to rear and side to side. Um, you know, screw around with it a little bit. And once you get the weights as even as you can, then you want to adjust your uh, perch height so you have a equal cross weight percentage from the, um, on both sides of the car. So your cross weights are equal, then your car is going to have the same balance and right and left turns. That's just in, the, in a quick nutshell, but that's what cornering, corner balancing does. And race car, you always got to corner balance it. Street car, just get your perch heights equal from side to side, and in my opinion, that's good enough. And finally, if you're playing around with your ride height, try to get the look you want and messing around with having enough wheel travel. Uh, anytime you probably change your, uh, your ride height significantly, let's say like more than a quarter inch, you should probably get your alignment rechecked uh, before you just start driving around. That's just a good rule of thumb. So now we're going to get into the part that you've been waiting for, how to mess with the knobs, how to adjust the damping. Now this is a part that people think they know everything about, but then maybe they don't. So let's talk about some misnomers about damping. When you make your shocks softer or harder by turning the knob, you're not actually making your suspension softer or harder per se. Now, Turning the knob and increasing or decreasing your damping has nothing to do with your spring rates or your sway bar rates. Now how your car is balanced in steady state cornering is totally due to your spring rate and your sway bars. You know, this controls the slip angles that your tires run in and your overall over and understeer balance. What the damping does do though is it acts kind of like a uh, weight transfer capacitor. So, the shock can uh, delay or speed the way the weight transfers around the car. So when you increase your damping or make the damping stiffer, you're slowing down weight transfer. When you make the uh, damping softer, and um, you're actually speeding up weight transfer. That's one function. The other function is as a damper. 
Um, a spring is kind of like an energy storage device. Like you hit a bump, the spring compresses and turns kinetic energy into potential energy. Now, as soon as the bump passes, the spring wants to sprung out and extend and you know, return that potential energy and make it kinetic energy again. So when the spring is unconstrained and undamped, it wants to just continue to go boing, boing, boing and bounce. Every time it goes through that cyclic motion, you're loading and unloading the tire contact patch and that can cause a loss of traction and inconsistent grip. So what you do is you add a damper into the system and the damper absorbs some of that energy and takes the bounce out of it. Uh, so that's the other shock's uh, job of the shock is to take the bounce off and make smooth platform control and make it less bouncy, keep your tires firmly planted on the ground. Um, so that's what shocks do. So when you make things stiffer, you're not physically making your springs and shocks stiffer. You're not going to change your steady state cornering, but you are going to change uh, the way the car takes bumps and you are going to change the way the car responds to driver input. When you start adjusting your uh, damping, one of the most important things is to start with a high quality shock to begin with. Now we have KW and suspension techniques here, but there's any other number of high quality shock companies on the market. So buy, buy your shock from a reputable manufacturer. Now we've done things like taking apart uh, eBay shocks or kind of um, second tier shock company shocks. And you'd be surprised what we found. I mean, we found like really crude valves. that's like a washer in the spring. Uh, we found, um, shocks that have like the same calibration and compression and rebound with really crude valves. Uh, we found shocks where the adjusting knobs just spin around and the shaft goes down to the shock and actually isn't attached to anything. Um, we've experienced in some of our customer cars like cheap like eBay coilovers that were so bad that the car was so uh, unstable and dangerous it was scary going 60 on the freeway and almost uncontrollable and bumpy turns. So if you want to get good consistent results and you want to be able to actually do serious tuning, uh, stick with better shocks, please. As a very basic to a uh, shock adjustment, um, what I've seen how most people mess themselves up um, at the track or in high performance street driving is they make their damping settings way too stiff. I don't know if it's a guy thing, but a lot of people are, if some is good, more is better. And if I have more than anybody else, I'm the best. But that's not the way it works. Um, a lot of times as a consultant, I would say probably even 80% of the time, I end up going a lot softer in the damping settings than how the car actually came to me as. Uh, one of the reasons is if you run a lot of damping, uh, the, the suspension kind of almost locks up and the shocks don't do their job with absorbing shock. They actually turn into like rigid uh, cylinders and a lot of the bump response and everything gets transferred to the tires as tire shock. Now you might hear me talk about tire shock a lot and it sounds like a complicated term but really it's not. Um, a tire is basically an air spring um, it's an air spring, but the thing about it is it doesn't have very much damping. So uh, think of a basketball. When you bounce it on the ground, it bounces right back. So you want to prevent bounce back. So your shock absorber should be absorbing all the shocks so your tire doesn't uh, bounce like a ball. So your tire is an undamped spring. Let your shock do all the damping. Now, uh, almost all high quality single adjustable shocks on the market, um, the uh, adjustment knob mostly affects the rebound and mostly affects uh, what we call low speed rebound. Now you can make uh, damping, break it down into three stages more or less. You have your low speed, your mid speed, and your high speed. Low speed is um, a shock shaft velocity from zero to two inches per second. Now this is a really important place to have adjustability because a lot of what the drivers 
feels is affected here, and a lot of what affects the vehicle dynamics is affected here. So low speed is mostly what uh, affects body roll, uh, nose dive under braking, and squat under acceleration. Um, it also affects kind of like uh, how the car responds to steering wheel movement. So the driver can really feel what's going on here. So the next uh, range we're going to talk about is your mid speed. Mid speed is from two to around seven inches per second of velocity. Now what you feel in your mid speed is uh, what most of us call float. Now float is uh, maybe if you've been in an old Cadillac or a car with really worn out shocks, the car feels like a boat and it rolls around and it, it's unresponsive. Maybe it rides real smooth, but generally it's not pleasant. I mean, sometimes you can even get seasick in it. And uh, in extreme cases, the car gets unstable under undulations. And also like at high speeds, the car can get really unstable. Um, when you're going around high speed turns, like the car is like wallowing and can even feel like you're going to lose control, particularly in the back. So um, mid speed adjustment, um, usually these shocks, when you turn the knob, it affects the uh, low speed the most, but the adjustment also bleeds over into the mid speed. Uh, finally, there's high speed. High speed is uh, seven inches per second and higher. Now on the rebound, uh, this doesn't do a whole lot for ride comfort, but uh, when you do things like change your spring rate to a spring that has more rebound force, for instance, you may need to get your shocks revalved, especially in the high speed zone, because it helps control that rebound energy, especially when you hit bumps and the shock wants to rebound. That's kind of like a quick impulse, and uh, that's where you feel like the, the bobbing and stuff when you hit a bump, like especially if you have really stiff springs. Um, generally, the adjustment only affects high speed slightly, but it, 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 it still does. So the adjustment's gonna fix, um, affect your low speed the most, uh, your mid speed pretty decently, and a little bit on your high speed. So the basics of how to adjust your shocks is really important. And this is where everybody messes up. So instead of having that more is better mentality, uh, you need to have a less is better mentality. Generally, if you have the least amount of damping control to get the job done, to have a stable, well-balanced car, that's where you're gonna get the most mechanical grip. Uh, the way I do this is number one, uh, for your look in your instructions and start with your manufacturer's recommended baseline setting. Now, a company like uh, Suspension Techniques or KW has this in their instruction manual, but I find that most shocks don't have anything and the knobs can be set anywhere. So what I generally do is um, set everything at fully soft, which leads to another thing. Um, different companies, the knobs turn in different directions. Um, like a KW, uh, generally to make the damping stiffer, you turn clockwise. Softer, you go counterclockwise. Now, Coney and Saks can be totally in the opposite direction. So make sure you know which way you're turning your knob. If, um, like these knobs have uh, handy dandy arrows, but most companies don't have arrows on their knobs. If they don't, and there's just a blank knob, call them up and ask which way to turn. Now, uh, you wouldn't believe how even really smart people mess this up, but uh, don't just assume uh, clockwise is more, counterclockwise is less. Um, the other thing to do too is, when you make changes, write everything down. Because when you're making changes, uh, you can forget um, in between test runs, and uh, you can really mix, m mess yourself up. So have a little piece of notebook paper, write down where you started, and write down every single adjustment. So generally, if there's uh, no baseline setting that, that uh, is recommended, I make everything full soft, all four corners. When I go on a test drive, generally most shocks will be, uh, it'll feel soft, like the car will roll, squat and pitch a lot. It'll also be kind of bouncy. 
So then what I start doing is, um, you know, like I might go up, uh, increase the damping force like three clicks at a time, but if you're a beginner and you haven't done this too much, go up one click at a time and then do another short test drive and go up one click, one click, one click until the car feels nice and solid. Um, it still rides well, it takes bumps well, but your squat, pitch, roll, and steering response all feel good. And this is a really good place to start. Um, you know, generally, when you get your car like this, uh, the, the setting that feels good on the street will also be uh, pretty good on the track. You go to the track, you might want to go up a couple clicks all the way around, but uh, you know, don't go crazy. Um, this will give you the most mechanical grip, the best ride, and uh, the best response to your steering input. Now, it's really tempting to add more and more and more damping. Uh, some of this is because, like let's say in your front, the more uh, rebound you dial in, the crisper and more responsive the car might feel, but you're actually fooling yourself and some bad things could happen. So, but remember, less is more. And this is your basic setting, and unless you really want to get into it, maybe you should stop here, but let's go into a little bit more advanced things you could do to really affect the way your car um, handles with a single adjustable shock. Okay, so now we're going to talk about some more advanced ways and how to adjust your single adjustable shock. Now, you do this if you want to increase certain characteristics of your car to improve it, or if you want to mask some faults it has in the handling. So let's start with the front shocks. So let's say you have a car that you want to improve how it reacts in the corner entrance of a corner. Uh, you can increase your front rebound damping, and what that will do is it'll make the car turn in quicker. The car will respond more crisply to your steering inputs. Uh, this mostly affects the maybe first quarter of the first third of a turn. So if you have a car that you want to be crisper in transitions, like going through a chicane or something, or uh, going through the cones in an autocross, um, adding more front rebound can also improve the crispness and the uh, transient response. So the, the front will, will track more truer. Adding more front rebound uh, feels really good. Um, more and more can feel better and better, but then what could happen is the front suspension can start packing down and um, the rebound won't allow the front of the car to return. And the car can like jack lower and lower and lower until you're just dwelling on the bump stops. So don't be fooled by too much rebound. So some of the signs of too much uh, front rebound is you get tire shock. The most obvious thing is a poor, harsh, uncomfortable ride. Um, the next thing is uh, pack down. Now we talked about this briefly before, but in a series of bumps, the uh, car will just ratchet downward and travel until you're resting on the bump stops because the rebound won't let the car come back up. And then another symptom is the front of the car skips under cornering and braking. Uh, what this is is the car just kind of skips on the surface like a rock being skipped on the surface of a pond. It hops, and you don't get traction. Next, the front of the car generally has poor traction under bumps. If there's bumps or undulation, the car kind of hops over them and you don't get traction. You're getting tire shock. Another one that might not occur to you is sometimes you'll have poor corner exit traction um, under the gas coming out of a corner. The front of the car is locked down so you don't get dynamic weight transfer and your back doesn't uh, get the grip because of that. Uh, this is kind of noticeable in things like dirt track and uh, drifting. Finally, for drag race starts, you may have poor off the line traction because the car won't react to getting launched and you won't get the dynamic rear uh, weight transfer that the car needs to hook up. So now we're going to talk about some of the symptoms of too little front rebound. Uh, the number one thing is the front of the car feels floaty. Um, you've probably experienced this in some cars maybe, like you're going fast, the front of the car feels light, it, it, and it starts kind of wavering around and it doesn't feel like it's going to respond to your steering or even maybe go out of control. It's not a good feeling. 
Uh, you got to get rid of that and you add more front rebound. Another symptom of too little front rebound is slow sluggish turn in. A lot of you probably have felt this, like you're coming up to a corner fast, you turn the wheel and the car doesn't really respond. You crank in more steering input and the car slowly starts to turn in, but it kind of goes into a grinding understeer because you're not rotating the car right. Um, sometimes adding some front rebound will help this. Another symptom of too little front rebound is the car gets blown around a lot in the wind. Well, this is another thing that can feel really scary. So it's another thing that little rebound can clean up a little. Finally, the, when you're uh, dialing in the throttle on the exit of a corner, the front of the car will rear up and the steering will get light and maybe the front will push to the outside of the turn. Um, this is another um, symptom of too little front rebound. Um, I know you want to get dynamic weight transfer to the rear, but it is possible to overdo it and get too much. So you can crank in a little rebound and get that under control. So now you have examples of uh, what to do to fix certain problems, what too much adjustment causes, and what too little causes. So I hope that helps you play around with the front and solve some of your handling problems. Now that you know about the front, let's talk about the rear. So we're gonna talk about what adding more rear rebound can do to help you out. The first thing about adding more rear rebound is it slows the rear rotation of the car down. So what this means is the car responds slower to trail braking and lift throttle inputs uh, this gives you uh, more confidence to use these tricks to get the car rotated into the turn um, and not get into understeer. Uh, it also makes uh, oversteer caused by these things a lot easier to catch, which gives you a lot more confidence. More confidence is always a good thing. Adding more rear rebound can give you more rear stability in high speed turns. Probably a lot of you have been in, in like high speed sweepers where maybe you're going flat out in third or fourth and the back of the car kind of moves around and gives you that funny uh, see of the pants feeling that's not too secure. Well, if you dial in a little bit more rear rebound, it'll clean that up a lot of times and uh, make a turn go from butt puckering to just normal. That's a, it's a good trick. Another thing that more rear rebound can help is the car will hunker down better on the gas coming out of a turn and this can give you more rear traction and a little bit more driver feel to what the back of the car is doing. Uh, you're getting the dynamic weight transfer back on the rear wheels and gives you more grip on the exit. Adding more rear rebound can also reduce uh, brake dive and uh, rear wheel lockup. That's always a good thing. Uh, rear wheel lockup can cause braking instability and maybe some butt puckering coming up to a turn. Rear rebound cleans it up. Uh, adding more rear rebound can give you more stability on transitions. Uh, what this does is when you do a quick right lift like in a chicane or when you're going through slalom cones, it makes the rear end step out less and can make the car easier to control and let you get on the gas a lot sooner. When you're overall cornering and driving around uh, at high speeds to medium speeds or even low speeds for that instance, but I mean we're talking about race car speeds, it makes the back of the car follow the front a lot quicker. Um, this just gives you a more one with the car feeling and makes the car easier to drive. Finally, uh, a little bit more rebound can give you more traction in the drag launch. Uh, the front of the car goes up, the back squats down, and having some rebound kind of helps you keep the rear tires weighted. Like if the back of the car pops right back up, you un unweight your tires, but if you slow that down a little bit, it gives you a little bit more traction um, out to like around 30 feet and stuff. Uh, so that's a good thing. So here's some of the things that happen when you have too much rear rebound. The first one's tire shock. You get a harsh, uncomfortable ride and the car kind of hops around. That's no good. Uh, the second one is the back of the car loses uh, grip in general. Back of the car hops and skips. Uh, this is kind of scary, especially in cornering because 
hopping and skipping in the back of the car is twitchy oversteer. So that's not any good. So if you're a driver, you've, you've probably driven cars that are like that and you probably didn't like it. So that's a sign of too much rear rebound. Uh, another sign of too much rear rebound is the car packs down. So it progressively gets lower and lower in the back as you hit uh, sequential bumps. And finally the back of the car ends up on the bump stops. The, the damping's not allowing the back of the car to come up and you have a solid rear suspension. So the car will start skipping and hopping. That's not good. Finally, this is kind of an uh, insidious problem that's a little bit hard to cure. Um, when you turn in the car, the car turns in sluggishly and understeers. And then when you're pivoting the car around and going for corner exit, the car suddenly starts to oversteer. Um, this is a sign of too much rear rebound actually. And uh, uh, it's kind of a common problem. It's also one of the worst things you can do to make your car go around the corner fast. Imagine your car understeers on entrance and oversteers kind of wildly on exit. Not only is that a handful, but um, it's uh, really slow. And uh, getting rid of some rear rebound fixes this a lot of times, believe it or not. Now, um, the opposite of too much is too little. These are some of the signs of too little rear rebound. The rear of the car feels floaty and loose. Um, this is uh, really bad in high speed turns, like your front might be tracking pretty good, but your rear is doing some oscillation. Car feels unstable and weird, and it's this unsteady, weird, floaty, almost corkscrewy thing in the back. And uh, adding rear rebound will clean this up, but not having enough can kind of make your butt pucker. Uh, another sign of too little rear rebound, it's almost like the first, but maybe the car is kind of doing a fast twitch in the rear. Uh, this is a, in a car that you have some rear toe steer and the suspension's just moving around a little too much and your toe's changing. So it's a quick, even more scary, unstable feel in the back. So a lot of times adding more rebound cleans that up and you'd be surprised how much it can make things better. Um, another thing is, um, like let's say you're doing a uh, drag launch, the car like digs out of the very hole okay, but when you get to about 30 feet, you smoke the back tires. Um, that's a sign of too little rear rebound. So the car will squat, transfer weight good, uh, you'll launch good, but then right as you start initiating, before you get to the 60 foot point, the car will rebound back up, unweight the tires, and you'll uh, lose traction. Adding some rebound helps in that case. Another thing is, overall, if the car feels unstable, hard to drive, and scary, a lot of times just adding a little bit, bit of rear rebound cleans it up. So that's kind of my more advanced shock guide. Um, now, I've said a lot, and it's hard for me to say all this without Jeff's editing here. And if, if it's a little choppy, I'm, I'm kind of sorry, but it's hard to do this in front of the camera. And hey, I'm not an actor. So if you want to see it um, all written down, you can go to MotoIQ.com. Uh, we have an article about this and we have a list. You can print it out, put it in your toolbox with you at the track. We're going to have a link to all this below and just click on the link, go to MotoIQ. You'll have this all written down and you don't have to listen to my piss poor delivery. So when you're making these shock changes, when you're a beginner, uh, I suggest making big swings at like three or four clicks. Kind of depends on the brand of your shock. If it's like a KW, uh, KWs have probably 16 clicks or so. So you want to maybe do three at the most, but some shocks like Tanes or something might have 24 clicks. So you want to do maybe four clicks with one of those. And some shocks have 40 something clicks and those are usually your eBay ones and you can spin the knob all the way around and probably nothing will happen. So, um, but the thing is when you're beginning, don't be afraid to take a swing at it. Uh, make a big enough swing for you to feel. Um, the better you get, the more of a feel you, you'll get to how many clicks will do what. But initially take bigger swings at it. Like, don't be afraid. 
when you had start adjusting your shocks, I also recommend you experiment, like experiment on the track, take big swings at, shoot, adjust everything, get a feel for it, kind of like uh, what they did the coal in Days of Thunder, but that's how you learn. And don't be afraid to turn the knobs because uh, you know, your car might start handling worse and get slower, but you're not gonna suddenly hurdle out of control. I mean, just take it easy a little bit when you first make an adjustment and uh, you know, get a feel for what the adjustments do, learn. Uh, once you learn in your car, uh, you can help your friends. And uh, if you get really good at it, maybe you can even make a living of it like how I do. So you know, get in there, adjust your shocks, have fun and go a lot faster. So if you like this video and you wanna see more, um, be sure to hit the subscribe button down there. It helps us in the algorithm. Uh, I know this is a long and confusing subject, so if you got questions about adjustments on your own car, uh, make a comment below. I'll do my best to answer them. Uh, I try to, uh, I'm not perfect, but uh, I'll, I'll help you out. Um, if you want to read more in detail, go to MotoIQ.com, follow the links. Uh, I wrote this ultimate guide to suspension tuning. Uh, we'll have those links down there too. Uh, you can probably read for a few days of all those things and learn all about your suspension. Um, if you want us to do your suspension or you need some suspension consulting, go to MotoIQ and hit our uh, garage services button and fill out what you want us to do and we'll get back to you. Um, but uh, I hope there's a lot of information out there for you. I don't think anybody has done a how to adjust your shock video that's any good. Uh, I hope you think this one's good. I hope it, I hope it helps you uh, go faster. Uh, if you follow these instructions, you surely will go faster if you can drive any good. Um, so I'm going to have some more uh, segments on this. Uh, we're going to talk about how to adjust more complicated shocks like uh, two, three, four, and five way. Uh, you can really mess those up real good, but I'll teach you how not to mess those up. So until next time, uh, I'll see you around.